Timothy chapter 1, and in that lesson, we did try to establish the foundation and the reason why Paul wrote the second book of Timothy. Anybody remember? Why did Paul write the book? I gave you three reasons. Anybody remember? Why did Paul write the second book of Timothy? Yes, to encourage Timothy. Yes. Passing the baton on to Timothy. Yes. That's correct. Yep, that's all about encouraging Timothy. Yep, but there was number one reason I told you. Number one reason. He was in prison and he was lonely. You see what people suffer for the faith. He was in prison and he was lonely and he wanted that company. He wanted that, you know, somebody to share in his suffering. And um, you remember it was Nero that put him in prison. It was a time of great persecution. You see, this is Second Timothy is totally different from First Timothy, where Paul was still active, let's put it that way, in, in going on a missionary journey. He was going to Macedonia in First Timothy, and there was a, a problem at the church in Ephesus, and he sent Timothy to go and you know look after that church. But Second Timothy is totally different, different setting where Paul is in prison, he's in chain, unlike his other imprisonment where he was under house arrest but here he was in chains and he mentioned a particular man you know that looked for him and searched and searched and searched until he found him that means even his friends the people he knew the people that knew him you know they didn't even know where to find him that's to tell you how difficult a moment it was in Paul's life at that time Amen. And then he wrote this book to Timothy, urging him to hold on fast to the faith. He said, these are the things that I've taught you. Don't lose hold of it. Hold on to it. And then actually, the book of 2 Timothy was Paul's last book. Because uh, as history will have it, uh, he was executed. He, he had his head cut off. But here we are today enjoying the revelations, benefiting from the suffering and the pain of the great Apostle Paul. So, let's get into it. So, second, second Timothy, we're going to start from chapter 2, because like I said, we did chapter 1 last week, okay? Chapter 2, from verse 1, it says, Now therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Okay? You see here, Apostle Paul is saying, Be strong, Timothy. This is my encouragement to you. Be strong in the grace that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. Not from the grace of knowing me. Okay? Not from the grace of, of being a bishop. Not from the grace of, you know, your earthly possessions or your earthly um, status or anything. But the grace that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because that only is the true foundation. Amen. Because if you put your faith if you put your hope, if you put everything in you on any other ground, believe me, there will come a time when that thing will crumble. If your faith is in your job, it's in your husband, it's in your inheritance, it's in you know your family life, it's in this, it's in that, you know, any other thing other than the Lord Jesus Christ. As believers, we don't put our faith on those things. You know why? Because they are only temporary. They are only here for a time. How many of you have been in, in trouble? Maybe you forgot your wallet at home. And you think, if I can just ring this guy, 
he will fix this problem. He will come and get me. Or something like that. Or, or something. You ring him, he goes straight to voice message. <laughs> and, and then if you have ever that, yeah, straight to voice message. That, that's the person you were really hoping that I call him, he's going to come and, you know, fix the problem. You know, then six hours later, he rings you. Oh, you, did you ring me? <laughs> <laughs> then the harm has already been done. What does that tell us? Only in Christ Jesus can we have hope and faith because he's the one that never, ever fails. Amen. But this is something, if you read verse 2, that is also very, very important. You see, Apostle Paul said, the, this doctrine, this teaching that you have heard from me, I want you to not only hold on to it, but teach it also to other people, hang on, people who will be able to understand it, people who will be able to grasp it and teach it to others. Is, isn't that interesting? Very interesting. If you look at it carefully, you find out that Apostle Paul, his one main purpose, even at the point of near death, even at the point of prison, his one purpose is how do we spread the gospel? Amen. How do we spread the gospel of Jesus Christ? That's why he said to Timothy, I mean, this is not Bible college, but this is actually, and uh, time will fail me to go into the different tactics. But you see that it's not a blueprint here. You teach the word to somebody. Yeah? Teach him, make him understand it, make him live it so that he can teach the other person. You see, and the other person does the same. You see, before long, what happens, you see, we have a whole heap of disciples who understand the word of God and follow it. You see, that is the blueprint of God in spreading his kingdom. Amen. Apostle Paul didn't say to Timothy, whatever I taught you, keep it to yourself. Keep it to yourself. No, you know, you teach it to able men who will be able to take that same gospel and spread it on. Amen. So what happens then is that the word of God grows. The word grows. Amen. And it's established. Verse 3. Oh, this one is heavy. <laughs> this is heavy. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Ah, this is heavy because this is not in anybody's vocabulary today. Hardness. What do you mean, hardness? Why should I? I want everything easy. I want everything smooth. But here is Apostle Paul saying, you need to endure hardness as a soldier. You see? So at the end of the day, it really depends on how you see yourself. If you see yourself as a soldier, then hardness will not be an issue for you. You see? But unfortunately today, the kind of gospel that we want to live is a milk and honey gospel where everything is sweet, everything you know happens right on time. You know, it's as if we just open our mouth and go, God, just bless me, <laughs> just bless me, feed me with milk and honey. But I tell you, you know, why we love the blessing of God, and God is definitely a good God, He's a good Father, He blesses us, but we must also be prepared, and that's the word be prepared. For your faith to be tested. You know, have you heard of people who say, Oh, I don't go to church anymore. Why? Uh, someone hurt me from church. You know, somebody said something that I didn't like. They treated me the way that I didn't like. Then, now, I don't go to church anymore. Uh, but I'm still a Christian. So where is the endurance of hardness? Where is the endurance of hardness? Uh, aren't you blessed today that we're not living in, in the days when Nero sends his, his soldiers to go in the street and fish out Christians? You see, that was the era Timothy was living in. And Paul is saying to him, endure hardness. Endure hardness. It's unfortunately that today, uh, you know, so many people, you know, we have everything. Everything is easy, everything is comfortable. But there's no hardness. But I was supposed to endure hardness. Today, 
what we will actually, if you were today, you know what Apostle Paul will be saying? Endure inconvenience. Because we don't, we don't, you know, there's no hardness anymore. It's just inconvenience. The inconvenience of getting into your air-conditioned car, <laughs> the inconvenience of driving on your good road and coming to church to sit on well, you know, cushioned chairs. Do you know there are people, yeah, who walk two days by foot, they walk to get to church just to worship God. And they sit down on the floor. I've been to one of those churches. It's just what they have on the floor is just touch, you know, bamboo on the floor. And they all sit down and they worship God and the power of God still comes down. But uh, if we come now, we have a, um, what is it? A wooden chair, uh, nobody will sit. Wooden chair, no way. We've got to have well cushioned chairs. Yeah, when people go to church, they're looking at the facilities. Ah, they are very good cafe. <laughs> I'm going to go back there. The cafe, oh, the coffee there is wonderful. <laughs> Even if they have to sit on the floor, they would not come to church. I was still alive to They're not sitting on the floor for any chair. No way. But here's a for supposed to endure hardness. Endure hardness as a soldier. Because, verse 4, no man that worried entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who had chosen him to be a soldier. If you read it in the Amplified Version, it says, No soldier entangles himself with civilian affairs. Yeah? No soldier involves himself in civilian affairs. A soldier is battle ready. Every day, every time. So he does not go and involve himself in civilian affairs. If we put it plainly, what Apostle Paul is saying here is, how does, what does it mean for a believer, for a soldier to entangle himself in civilian affairs? Okay? You will first of all have to look at it. What does a soldier do? A soldier is normally, okay, in camp. He doesn't have that luxury of just, you know, sitting down at home, waking up at uh, 10 a.m. with remote in his hands, changing channel to channel, looking for what, you know, what interests him. No, he's, he's out there. He's out there. Amen. He's out there. He's well dressed. He's prepared. He's combat ready. You go and speak to any soldier who has been deployed. And they will tell you, <laughs> it's, you know, you don't have all these luxuries that you have. Some of them are sleeping in tents. They are sleeping in, you know, all kinds of situations. Some are in the bush. You see? That's one of the things you have to endure as a soldier. Okay? You have to learn to improvise. Because sometimes, the, the things that you really need, they might not be there. Because you are out there in the bush. Okay, here is Apostle Paul saying, do not entangle yourself with civilian affairs because you are a soldier. What he's saying invariably is that as a Christian, don't dabble in the things of the world. That's what he's saying. Let your mindset be different from that of the mindset of the people in the world. That's when Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And every other thing will be added unto you. You see, being a soldier of Christ, it basically means, first of all, that we don't entangle ourselves with civilian affairs. What does that mean? Does that mean we bury our head in the sand and forget that, you know, this word is it? No. You know, there are so, some Christians, I tell you, you bring them and you ask them about what's happening today in, in our world. They have no idea. That's not what Apostle Paul is saying. You ask them, oh, you know, world affairs, you know, current affairs, they have no idea. You ask them about the economy, they have no idea. You ask them about 
or you know what Paul is where well, they have no idea. That's absolutely not what Paul is saying. Okay? Some people sit down, they you know, they sit down at home all day, they don't go to work, they don't do anything. Oh, because I need more time to pray. No, that's actually not what Apostle Paul is saying. What he's saying is that even though we work, even though we live amongst the people of this world, we do not have the same outlook in life. Why? This man, have you noticed that some people are very selfish? Twenty dollars seem like a lot of money. Hey, you go to church. You, one of the reasons why people don't go to church in this country is because when they go to church, yeah, the offering bowl goes past and they're so stingy they don't want to put ten dollars in that box. It's why, yeah, because they're so stingy. Okay, but for us, you see, when we come to church and we put money in the offering bowl. It's, it's not because we um, are too much, okay? But it's act of love for our God. We see it as an act of worship. Are you listening to me now? Amen. So, whereas the unbeliever is thinking, if I take that twenty dollars to the supermarket, he can buy me one, two, three, four, five, six. I can feed my whole family with twenty dollars. Yeah. You must have seen the ad on TV where it says, feed your family with $10. Yeah? And the person is thinking, oh, yeah, $20, that's two meals for my family. Yeah, if I just follow this cheap recipe. <laughs> okay? Whereas, to the believer, you see, we have a different mindset. We say, I'm putting this $20 in the offering bowl as an act of worship to the Lord my God. You see? Because... You see, it's not that we love him. <laughs> That's right. It's not that we love him. He loved us first. That's right. The Bible says, even while we were yet sinners, Christ Jesus commanded his love towards us. God commanded his love towards us, and Jesus died for our sins. So we're putting this in the offering bowl as an act of worship to him. Whereas the unbeliever is thinking, how many bottles of beer can I buy with this? Is it making sense? Yeah. You see, that's what Apostle Paul is saying. Don't entangle yourself with the affairs of this world. Don't go thinking the way they think. Don't go doing things the way they do their own things. Okay? And I can tell you, some people even, they say, oh, I'm a believer, but hang on, somebody invited me to their birthday party. And it's the same time, 10 a.m. on Sunday morning. Oh, I go to the birthday party and not come to church. You see, that's entangling yourself with the affairs of this world. You know why? Because you've just lifted, okay, that birthday party above your service to God. Okay? Or some people will say, oh, my house is very dirty. I, I work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Saturday, Sunday, I don't work. Sunday is going to be the time that I'm going to clean my house. And I'm not going to go to church. Oh, sister, why didn't you come to church today? Ah, I was cleaning my house. It means you've elevated your house and given it more importance in your list of priority over your worship of God. You see, that's what Apostle Paul is talking about. Don't be entangled in your mind Okay? Don't be entangled in your actions like the people of the world. Did everybody get that? Yeah. Okay? Apostle Paul, by saying, don't be entangled with the affairs of this, you know, world, is, is really not talking about economic activities. Amen? We can, we can engage in economic activities. Okay? We just have to set our priorities right. That's right. Everybody with me? Yeah. We've got to set our priorities right. When it's within your powers, okay, you put God first. No man that worried entangle himself with the affairs of this life, so that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. God has chosen every one of us here to be servants of him, to be his soldiers. Therefore, our number one reason our number one purpose is to please God. You see, unlike the people of this world and some Christians, 
who please God out of their convenience. Okay? They will only do things that relate to God only as far as it is convenient for them. Oh, I'm at home today. I'm bored. Let me go to church. <laughs> I got nothing else to do. Let me go to church. But if there's another thing that clashes with that same time, no way. They choose that thing over God. Sure. Okay? So, Apostle Paul says, all that Sodia does is to please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strives for masteries, yet he is not crowned except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruit. Amen. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Invariably, what Apostle Paul is saying, don't just read it, this thing once. Mm. Don't just read it once. Don't just read it once. Consider it. Sit down and think about it. Then you will understand what I've just said because these are deep, deep things. Amen. Because he's saying, okay, he that runneth in a race, if he does not follow the rule, what happens? He will be disqualified. You know, they just finished the Commonwealth game. And they will see, you know, I'm sure we all saw it. This athlete, I can't remember what he did. I think he, did he go out of his lane? Ah, that's what he did. He went out of his lane and he blocked the other guy. They disqualified him. You know why? He has not run according to the rules of the game. I think he came first. I think he was first. They, they took it from him and gave it to the other guy. Because that's the rule of the game. When you're running, there's tracks. That's why they mark the track. You cannot run and, and leave your own track and go and block another person. You see? Because he has not run according to the rules of the game. What does that mean for you and I today? It means that even though we seem to think, even though we seem to think as if, you know, the, 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 the road is just wide, Jesus never preached that. He said the road is straight and narrow. What does that tell us? It means there's also rules to this game. We don't just play it the way we like. We must follow the rules that God has set for us. Amen. When it comes to God, anything does not go. There is a sacrifice that is acceptable and there is a sacrifice that is not acceptable. We cannot just serve God any here, any how, and any way we like. There's a boundary. There's a boundary. And we've got to follow it. Otherwise, you will run, but in vain. Verse 8. Remember that Jesus Christ, of the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Now you've got to understand why Apostle Paul said this. Everybody see with me? Apostle Paul reinforced this particular saying because it is the foundation, okay? It is the bedrock of Christianity, amen? That Jesus Christ, okay, of the son of David, he came down from glory and he died for our sins, okay? Without him, we were damned. We were condemned. Without him, we had no life. He came and he gave us life. Amen. And not only did he do that, he was crucified. And after three days, he resurrected. Amen. Now, in that time period, there were many, many people who had different, different opinions and were carrying around different, different types of gospel. 
That's why Apostle Paul had to stress this with Timothy, that this is the gospel you preach. If, if people are preaching that Jesus did not really die, or Jesus did not really resurrect, or Jesus did, was not really the Son of God, and all that, he said, that's not the gospel. This is the true gospel. Amen. And that's what we must also adhere to today. You know why? It is the foundation. It is the bedrock. Amen. And if we build any other house, if we build any other structure that is not on this bedrock, that is not on this foundation, guess what? It is a fake house. It's a fake gospel. And a gospel that does not acknowledge that we were sinners. Amen. And then Jesus came and he died for our sins and he rose from the dead to give us life. Any gospel that is not based on that is false gospel. And we must watch out. Why? Because these days there are so many people who base their gospel on themselves. On what God has shown them, on what God can do through them, on what God, you know, and all that. Not on Christ. As we go ahead, you will see some of the examples that Apostle Paul gave. Verse 11, it is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. This one is powerful. I can spend a whole day on this one. Amen. If we be dead with him, then we shall also live with him. Which invariably means, if we are not dead with him, we cannot live with him. That's right. Well, what does it mean to be dead with him? The answer is very simple. It means that as believers, okay, we are now dead to the works of the flesh. When it comes to anger, when it comes to envy, when it comes to jealousy, when it comes to fornication, adultery, all those things are the works of the flesh. And we have become dead to the works of the flesh. That's what it means to be dead with Christ. So that we can arise and live with him. Amen. Apostle Paul made it clear. He said, here are the works of the flesh made manifest. And he listed all of them. And he said, don't deceive yourself. <laughs> don't deceive yourself. Okay? Anybody who does all these things cannot inherit a everlasting life. I'm not the one that said it. Paul said it. Anybody who does not die to the longings of the flesh, anybody who does not die to what their flesh wants, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You know why? Because they have not died. Therefore, they cannot live with Christ. You see, we have to die with him in order to live and resurrect with him. Come on, are you still with me? Yeah. yeah. It doesn't matter how many times you've been baptized. You know, when we baptize people, we say, you know, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Chew in the water, we bring you out. Yeah. But if you go and you continue to live a life that does not glorify God, okay, you continue to live in, in lies and envy and backbiting and, you know, and, and all this works of the flesh. Guess what? You just went in a dry sinner. You came back up a wet sinner. Right. Does it change anything? It doesn't. What makes us alive, because baptism is meant to be a representation, okay, of our being dead to sin with Christ and resurrection with him to life. You see, this is what I always think upon every time. When the devil came to tempt Jesus and he said, I want you to command these stones to become bread. Jesus said to him, Aha, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word 
that proceed out of the mouth of God. What does that mean? If you look at bread, okay, bread is for the flesh. True or false? Yeah, bread is only for the flesh. Yeah, if you think it's not somebody who is died, who has died, put bread in their grave. See, they will eat it. <laughs> it's only for the living and the flesh. Bread, when you eat bread, it's only meant to nourish your physical body. So what Jesus was invariably saying is man shall not live by everything that pleases his flesh. That's what Jesus was saying. A man shall not live by every craving of his flesh. A man shall not live by satisfying everything that his flesh wants. A man lives by the word of God. That's why sometimes you see people don't have self-control. You know why? Because they want to give and satisfy everything that their flesh wants. Are you listening to me? Yeah? Sometimes you may say, oh, but I'm not committing sin. It's true you're not committing sin, okay? But the food of ten people, only you, you sit down and wallop all of them. <laughs> That's gluttony. Yeah? But what have you just done? You've given way to the longings of your flesh. When somebody offends you and you cannot just exercise some self-control, yeah? You know what teachers teach little children? They say, hold your breath, breathe in, breathe out, yeah? Breathe in, breathe out, do it 10 times. <laughs> By the time you do it 10 times, yeah, that anger that is fuming inside of you is gone. But if you'll be so surprised, many adults cannot exercise self-control. Hey, you said this to me. Hey, I will, <laughs> I will show you what I am today. <laughs> and they just pour out all the anger in them. Okay? It's no self control. But Jesus said, Man shall not live by only the longings of his flesh alone. We've got to learn to kill those longings. That's right. And not satisfy them at every single time. It's not everything that your flesh asks for that your flesh should get. It's called self discipline, it's called exercising self control. Amen. Everybody stay with me. Yeah. I know this is not a popular saying in church anymore, but it's all right. I'm happy to be in the minority. Amen. Because, you know, we don't teach people anymore that they need to exercise self-control. Right. Amen. Where is self-control anymore? But it's one of the gifts of the Spirit, one of the fruits of the Spirit, sorry, to exercise self-control. That means that you've actually died to this flesh. You've died to the longings of this flesh. That's what being a Christian means. What did Jesus say? If somebody slaps you on one, give them the other one. It, it was not a statement to prove your stupidity. No. It was a statement what Jesus was actually getting at there is self-control. Are you with me? Yeah. That's what Jesus was getting at. Jesus is not saying, you know, bring out your head and let them just cut it off. That's not what he was saying. What Jesus was trying to teach us is self-control. Self-control, they slap you on this side, okay? You give him this side to slap, it does not mean you are stupid. What Jesus was teaching is you learn to exercise self-control. That's the message. You with me? Yeah. That's the message that Jesus is actually passing across. Self-control. But today there's no self-control anymore. No self-control, no patience. That's why the rate of adultery is so high. There's no self-control. No self-control. And I was supposed to say, I'm enjoying all things for the sake of this gospel. Verse 10. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, with eternal life. And we've got to remember that. Amen. 
We've got to remember that. You know, sometimes your life can be so busy. Sometimes you can face many challenges. Okay? Sometimes it seems as if, you know, when one trouble is finishing, you jump into another one. And when this is seem to be okay, there's another one coming. When this challenge, that's life. But in all of that, everybody with me, in all of that, the person who makes a success of their Christian race is somebody who is able to put in perspective and have Christ as the ultimate goal. Amen. And have him that he is our salvation and in him is our eternal glory. Apostle Paul said, all the things we are suffering now is nothing, nothing compared to the glory that lies ahead of us. Amen. You see, if you always have that at the back of your mind, you will always overcome. Because you know, I'm just passing through. I'm just passing through. I'm just passing through. There's glory ahead for me. The Bible says, Jesus, for the joy that was set ahead of him, he endured the cross. Amen. Verse 11, he says, oh, I've read this before. Yeah. It's a faithful saying, if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Verse 12, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Even Jesus himself said this. He said, if you are ashamed of me, yeah, I will also be ashamed of you before my father and his angels. Don't forget, there's glory laid ahead of us. Now, how do we deny Christ? Very easy. When we do not live according to his words. It doesn't mean that you, you open your mouth and deny and say Jesus is no longer Lord. That's not necessarily what it means. What it means is that when I do not live anymore by the fear of God, when I throw the fear of God out of the window and I do whatever my mind tells me to do, what have I done? I've denied Christ. He's no longer Lord. He's no longer Savior. He's no longer Master over my life. Then I've denied Christ. I do whatever I like. That means I've denied Christ. <laughs> if we believe not, yet he abided faithful, he cannot deny himself. That means with or without you, <laughs> with or without you, God is still God. You cannot hold him to ransom. God, if you don't do this for me now, oh God, it's not going to change anything. <laughs> he still will be God. <laughs> well, he still will be God. He's sovereign. Amen. And that's what it, I, I like us to understand this evening. He's sovereign. What does it mean to be sovereign? It means to be independent. His existence is independent of you. When Jesus was passing by, you know, the triumphant entry, what did the Pharisees do? Hey, 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 stop, 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 stop! Tell your disciples to stop! Tell them to stop! Uh, making a whole lot of noise. He said, even if I tell them to stop, God will raise the stones and they start praising me. Hallelujah. What does that mean? He's sovereign. He's independent of you. That also means that we should recognize and understand the might of God and learn to accord unto him the respect that he deserves. You know, some people think, oh, if I don't come to, any, to church anymore, I have Pastor William is losing. <laughs> Yeah, some people think if I come to church, I've come to do Pastor Bright a favor. If I come to Bible study, oh, I've come to do Pastor Bright a favor. Ah, he exists with or without you. Amen. He exists with or without you. When we come to worship him, it's actually an honor. And it's a privilege. What manner of love the Father has given unto us that we should be called the Son of God. It's an honor. It's a privilege. Because if we deny him, he cannot deny himself. Amen. He's sovereign. When Moses said, 
I'm going to, you, you ask me to go and meet these people. Uh, when I get there, who do I say sent me? I tell them I am. <laughs> tell them I am sent me. I am that I am. That means, regardless of you, I don't change. I am that I am. That's why the Bible says Jesus was the same yesterday. He's the same today. He's the same forever. He doesn't change. He's constant and he's sovereign and he exists independently of any one of us. Hallelujah. Do you know if we are going to walk away from the face tomorrow, God will still be God. <laughs> he'll still be God. He's sovereign. He said, I am sent me. I am. That means I don't need your permission to do anything that I want to do. I am that I am but you know so many times we tend to especially when things don't go well <laughs> one of the things that comes to Christians mind is say God why me <laughs> God why me <laughs> if not you who is <laughs> God why me it's as if we are questioning him why me why do I have to suffer this but I'm supposed to say rejoice in your persecution. Rejoice in your suffering. Amen. Amen. Because that's where growth comes from. That's where your character Amen. comes from. You know, and it's been developed in Christ. But we've got to recognize he cannot deny himself. He's God and he will be God forever. Regardless of your opinion. Verse 14. Of these things put them in remembrance. Charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. What does that mean? It means we should learn to focus on the main thing. You know, sometimes we get bogged down in unnecessary details. Unnecessary details. We get bogged down, we start to analyze and analyze and analyze. And then, I many of you have heard uh, paralysis by analysis. Yeah? Because you start analyzing and analyzing. In your process of analyzing, you then bring human wisdom into it, and then you start to make mistakes, and you start to fail. I'll just give you one example, okay? Are you listening to me? Some people said there are 39 classes of diseases. Yeah? The 39 classes, I've heard this before. 39 classes of diseases. And when Jesus went to the cross, Jesus was flogged 39 times. How many of you have heard that before? Jesus was flogged 39 times. That's actually not true. Yeah, but they, they, there's a lot of things. Yeah, they preach it. And that's actually not true. Because Jesus was not flogged by the Jewish. He was flogged by Romans. He was flogged by, he was the Roman soldiers that beat him up. Okay? It's only the Jewish that had 40 saved ones. Because in their law, okay, it says if you are a criminal, if you committed an offense, they should give you 40, okay? And because they don't want to go more than 40, they give you 39. So that's why they call it 40 save one. But that's only in the Jewish law, though. It's not the Roman law. The Romans don't care. They don't have that law. They, they're barbarians, okay? Their yeah, Paul was flogged, not Jesus. Paul was given... 30 save one. I'm sorry, 40, 40 save one. That was for Paul, not for Jesus. If you read your Bible, what happened after they judged him? They handed him to the Romans. And it was the Romans that beat him and put the crown of thorns on his head after all the lashes. Okay? What am I trying to get at? Jesus can heal you whether there's 39 or whether there's 50 or whether there's 200 classes of disease, it makes no it makes no difference. It makes no difference. Absolutely. Whether there's 10 or 5 classes of diseases, he's God. He's the I am that I am. He does not need anything to fit into the number of diseases that there are. He's sovereign. He's God. He can heal and he can deliver. We don't need to analyze anything to make it fit into what we think of him. He's God and he's sovereign. 
you cannot analyze him and put him in a box mm -hmm. because what you're then doing is you're going into science and you're not saying, oh, because he was flogged 39 times, there are 39 diseases, and then that he can do it regardless. Jesus was walking, he met a man that had no eyes. He just brought sand from the ground and created new ones. Easy, go and wash. The man was whole. Easy. He doesn't need any form of analysis for him to be what he is. Their analysis is only for you. Everyone with me? Yep. You cannot analyze God. His ways are past finding out. Hallelujah. And there's definitely no formula. Yeah? Oh, if you want to pray for somebody, say, say God bless you five times. <laughs> and they say Jesus ten times. And then the person, no, no. He doesn't work that way. He doesn't have a formula. He doesn't have a formula. I was telling my brother this evening, we don't have special prayers. Don't come to me and say, pray special prayer for me. I don't have special prayer. Every prayer that I pray is special. <laughs> No special prayer. So you, you, you want to then suggest that if I shout more <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I exercise myself more, yeah, and I jump up and I cry and I shout, that God is going to answer that more than just the one I said quietly. No. It doesn't work that way. God is not a man. That's right. Special prayer. What special prayer? Every prayer is special. Every prayer is special. You know why? Because we're praying to the Almighty God. Hallelujah. Yeah? There's no special prayer. Amen. When we pray, we release our faith. Okay? We're not just saying words which we do not believe in. We are saying words that we believe in from the bottom of our heart and we believe that God will be able and he's listening to that prayer Amen. therefore he will answer Amen. so I don't come and say hey, hey, hey I've been fasting for 21 days yeah, anybody that gives $50 right now hey I'm gonna pray special prayer ah your prayer will be uh, hey I just pray that prayer in well not lie God doesn't work that way. There's no special prayer. So if anybody comes to you and says, come, we'll pray special prayer for you. Tell them, Pastor Brad said, no special prayer. Amen. No special prayer. Every prayer is directed to God. With faith in your heart, God will hear you. Amen. Yeah, give me $500. I pray special prayer for you. <laughs> tell them, tell them, say, say a lie. <laughs> Amen. God is no respecter of persons. We can have a solemn assembly. We can say, let's let's be sober and pray to God, or let's apply our faith and believe. That's different. But for you to not call it special prayer. And yeah. All the things that happen in the Christian church. But you know, when we get to heaven, it's going to be very interesting. Very, very interesting. Special prayer, special offering. <laughs> anyway, let's go ahead. <laughs> let's go ahead. Amen. But you get in the picture? Yeah? God is no respecter of persons. He's certainly no respecter of gymnastics. Yeah? It's not by your somersaulting and, you know, yeah. it's not by your somersaulting and shouting and you, you're just expressing yourself. That's all. That's not what moves the hand of God. What moves the hand of God is faith. It's faith that moves the hand of God. Not how many times you shout. No, how loud you shout. Ah, okay, you remember this? I mean, okay, I just remember this example now. You know a woman called Hannah? She was in the temple and she was praying. You see, because there was so much agony, 
Amen. There, there was so much agony. Yeah. The, the words that she was saying was inaudible. Mm -hmm. The priest came and said, hey, woman, what are you doing? You, you drunk? Mm -hmm. He said, leave me, my Lord. I'm not drunk. No. I know what I'm doing. And she kept praying, pouring out her heart yes. to God. Yes. What happened? God heard her prayers. Amen. God heard our prayers. What does that tell you? It's not the shouting, it's not the jumping up and down that answers the prayer. It's that faith, that, that agony that has been poured out. That faith in Christ. Amen. So we don't come and start manufacturing things that are not in the Bible. Amen. It's true. We don't come and start manufacturing things that are not in the Bible and start making inferences where they are not. Amen. Oh, this one's very interesting. Verse 15. Verse 15. Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study. That's the key word there. Study. He said to Timothy, Study. You see, when you study, and you are well read and you are well versed, then you'll be hard for anybody to deceive you. You'll be hard for anybody to come and deceive you with things that are not even in the Bible. Study so that you show yourself approved. Not unto man. You see, there's two types of studies. There's one you study so that you get head knowledge your head is so big you come out you start to speak all kinds of big big grammar yeah. oh big big grammar you go oh hey i'm studying i'm going to preach tonight i'm studying i'm, I'm, ah, I'm going to confuse them tonight you come and say the eschatological ecclesiastical order but nobody understood what you have said so, <laughs> so what have you done you just study and get your got your you know your head knowledge, but this the study, okay, which is the one to gain revelation and to gain understanding. I mean, I mean. That is studies, not the one so that you can go and prove to every uh, uh, you know every Dick and Harry that that you know the scriptures. Mm -hmm. You know sometimes when I interact with people, you know when people say, oh yeah, I'm a pastor. Then they want to prove to you that they really know the Bible. <laughs> I've seen it many times. They want to prove to you that they know the Bible. Then they start speaking all this, you know, go here, speak this, speak that. And I'm just looking at them. The letter kill it. But the Spirit give it life. When you study, be after the Spirit, not after the letter. It's not a matter of filling your head with the words. Verse 16, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their world will eat as though it a canker, of whom is Hermanus and Philetus. Okay? Vain talk, vain things, the unnecessary things that are not in the Bible. You start analyzing and bringing them out and doing, you know, patterns and design, and they will lead to more ungodliness. You say the gospel of Jesus is very simple. We were sinners. We were dead in our sin. Okay, there was no life in us, but Jesus came as the sacrificial lamb and the sacrifice. The, and he died on the cross as a sacrifice that gave us life. On the third day, he rose from the dead and he triumphed over hell, sin, and the grave and gave us abundant life. That is the gospel. Very simple. I wish the church would continue to preach the gospel. I wish the church would stick to preaching the gospel. Instead of coaching, instead of motivational messages, instead of all types of things that you cannot even find in your Bible. No. I wish the church would stick to the Great Commission. I wish we would stick to seeing men being transformed from the inside out because that is the gospel. Amen. 
any gospel that does not produce transformation, that gospel is questionable. Your pocket is full of money, your bank account is full of money, but your heart is not transformed. Tell me, is that, that's not the gospel. That is not the gospel. You know all the motivational, uh, uh, you know, tests and everything. You are motivated. You want to go for it. You want to do this. Yeah? But you got envy in your heart. Yeah? You got envy in your heart. You got jealousy in your heart. You got anger. You got unforgiveness. Tell me, what kind of gospel is that? You still go home and drink. And drink and drink and drink. But you say, oh, I'm an evangelical Christian. I'm a Christian. You go home and you get into the bottle and you are drunk. You say, hey, oh, no, no, my, my kids don't wear trousers. Not trousers. You must tie your hair. You must do this. You must do that. Yeah. But you go home and you, you get into the bottle and you are drunk. Where is the transformation? She tell me, where is the transformation? True gospel is transformation. When Jesus met Zacchaeus, okay, everybody stay with me? The short man, Zacchaeus. When Jesus met him, the Bible said Jesus looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down. Tonight I'm going to have supper with you. What happened? The man had an encounter with Jesus. He got home and he brought out his money and he said, Lord, I give half of my money away to the poor. And he said, if there's anybody here who have cheated unlawfully, come, I will pay you back. That, you see, that's change. That's transformation. Not, I've had an encounter with Jesus, the two of us have had supper together, but I continue to be a, a tax collector that cheats people. And I just continue. You see, no change. No change in my life. Of what use is it then? True gospel brings change. True gospel brings repentance. So if you've been a Christian for 50 years and you look at yourself, there's no change. The things you were afraid of 51 years ago is still the same thing you are afraid of today. Then you have to look at yourself and ask the question, where is the change? Where is the change? If there is no change, I earnestly urge you to sit down and reconsider. You know, there is no shame in becoming born again. Really born again. And forget all the fake one that you've been doing. True. <coughs> forget all the fake one that you've been doing. Come to Jesus and rededicate your life and be truly born again. So that there is change in your life. So that there is transformation. If any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. All things are passing away. All things have become new. There's no point saying, I'm not I'm a Christian, I've been a Christian for 50 years, but you're still a thief. What point is that? <laughs> what point? You're still a thief. You're stealing every day. Amen. Verse 18. Who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Remember why Apostle Paul had to go back and explain it to, to, to Timothy that to hold on to this, that Jesus died, he resurrected. Okay? 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Depart from iniquity. We're going to end it here on this verse because of time. But you can see that the gospel is actually a very simple gospel. Let everyone that named the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Depart from iniquity. This is the gospel. And Apostle Paul said, 
having the same, God knows them that are his. Therefore, let everyone that name the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That change and that transformation must be visible. People must be able to see and know that, ah, this man is changed. This man is different. Remember the, the blind man that was sitting at the gate? After he was healed, people noticed. They said, ah, is he not that blind man? Why? He had an encounter with the power of the Holy Ghost. Ah, isn't this that man that was lame? He had an encounter and it was heavy. It was obvious. You are a Christian, but it's not obvious. You're a secret disciple? There must be change. It must be obvious. When people are interact with you, when people, they must, they must know that there's something different. Amen. All right, we're going to end it here tonight, like I said, because of time. We're not in a hurry. We examine every, every verse by verse. Our next week will continue from where we start. Any questions? Any questions? So in the conclusion, Pastor, um, in the